Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are here today to talk about four wonderful masterpieces, four sonatas, Opus 26, Opus 27, number one and two, and the so-called pastoral sonata, Opus 28. I hope you can hear me, can you? Very good. These four works were all written in the year 1801. Very productive year in the life of Beethoven. And with these four sonatas, we come to the end of this so-called early period. If we divide the 32 Beethoven sonatas in, in three groups, early, middle, and late, then we could say that the group, the first group closes with Opus 28. However, if you remember our last program, which ended with Opus 22, <laughs> the last movement was... Well, To me, this is the last very classical sonata of Beethoven. And with the four works that we are exploring today, we come into a very experimental, a very interesting phase. Uh, Beethoven is trying to reach new territories, new heights here. And with astonishing results. Each work, you can say this to all of the 32 sonatas, each work is different. It, it has its, all, its own personality, its own character. Um, but now we are really in, in, in a very new field, very new territory. Uh, you just heard the theme of the A-flat major sonata opus 26 that I just played for you. We have a, a work in four movements, all in the tonality of A-flat, three in A-flat major, the, the third movement, a funeral march, in A flat minor. None of the four movements are in sonata form, and yet the piece is called sonata. This is something extraordinarily new. It has never happened before. Not with Beethoven and not with his predecessors. To start a sonata with theme and variations, it's, it's already very unusual but not without a precedent. Mm -hmm. 
This is the famous Mozart Sonata, K331, with the famous Turkish march. And this is, as far as I know, the only piano sonata prior to Beethoven's Opus 26 that starts with theme and variations. But Beethoven thinks very differently from Mozart. Anyway, I always feel that there is very little in common between Beethoven and Mozart, and quite a lot in common between Beethoven and Haydn, as I mentioned before. Even if Beethoven was a very, very naughty and ungrateful student of Haydn's. Uh, but Haydn was also a, a great master of variation. I mean, his, his symphonies, his string quartets, and if you think of his F minor variations. Mm -hmm. This is one of his most profound and marvelous masterpieces, and Beethoven must have known this. So, we have the theme of the A-flat major sonata, which, which is a wonderful composition by itself, because it is so profound. And I don't understand why so many people complain that Beethoven was not a great melodist. I mean, how can you write something so beautiful melodically? eight bars and we get a variation within the variation. And closing the period. The second part. asymmetrical because we had always four bars, four bars, and now we had a ten bar phrase. And then we come back to the initial symmetry. faced with the first sonata in the 32, where luckily we have Beethoven's manuscript at our disposal. Up, up to this point, unfortunately, all the other sonatas, the manuscripts had been lost. And it's wonderful to, to, to follow this handwriting. It is in Krakow, in the Jagiellonian Bibliotheque. And Beethoven had been not, not very sparse with his instructions. He gave us a lot of his instructions in dynamics. Already this, this very subtle theme is full of crescendi, diminuendi, accents, subito piano, subito forte. So it's, it's very, very intricately marked. It's not black and white. Now we have a set of variations. First one. So we can follow the bass line. And he's using the melody as, as the basis of the variations, and he's, he's using always 
smaller and smaller note values. So here we have already uh, hemidemi semiquavers. And also we can observe his vision of, of using registers. Uh, this is a great composer, pianist, a great virtuoso, but already we can see that he's not thinking in pianistic terms. He's, he's using the bass register, it's, it's like, a, like a viola, and that it's another instrument. Now second violin, first violin, and viola. Already the, the great string quartet composer is here. He had already written the first six string quartets, Opus 18, and very often in, in the piano sonatas we, we find four-part, four-voiced structures, which, which is reminiscent of the string quartet. Now the second variation comes. This is almost pointillistic. It's like some of those impressionist paintings where you have the little dots and together they form a picture. You, you hear the, the theme in the bass and it is complemented in the right hand with syncopations. Uh, I go from the second part now. <laughs> piano pianissimo with very little subtle accents that, had, that has to be, they have to be exactly observed. And it's also, it has something humorous about it because it's, I think it's very funny when a pianist is unable to synchronize his two hands. It's like, <laughs> poor guy, he's not able to, to play together. Um, and now comes something astonishingly new. So it's in A flat minor. It's a very unusual key for the time. Of course, it's the tonic minor, but it says you have a lot of, lots of flats. And um, we will see later that this A flat minor variation foreshadows the great funeral march that is still to come, but we don't know it yet. We have to listen to, to a Beethoven sonata as if we would be hearing it for the first time. That is the great thing about it. And then I continue. In the bass, we have Sforzandi, but within piano, and they are they are almost menacing. They are, to me, quite threatening. Uh, then he uses a new harmonic device. Quite dissonant, and again... Uh,
next variation almost like like on a different level on a different planet different registers. I mean, I'm playing it all on one piano, but I'm trying to imagine hundreds of different instruments who are... This is one instrument, and, and, then, and then a flute, then a clarinet, then two... You can think of different instruments, whatever you, you want, but not the piano. And finally, the last variation an apotheosis it's, it's a wonderful sonority I and mean, we have not had sonorities like that in the previous Beethoven sonatas you can hear like Na nature sounds like like a forest murmuring <laughs> and the, the the notes of the melody are very cleverly concealed and then he's he's hiding the the tune in the middle voice started this last variation with triplets and then you have uh, uh, hemidemis quavers after that and then he goes into a, a cantabile section Alto. And that would be the end of the movement, but now comes a very beautiful poetic coda. These, these octaves in the bass are like cello and double bass pizzicatos. So, here we would have the first movement theme and five variations, and in a nutshell, it mirrors the whole structure of the sonata. I would group it in, in four parts, theme and the first two variations as a first movement, then the minor variation stands as the slow movement, the fourth variation is the scherzo, and sudden, suddenly the last variation is finale and coda. Therefore, Although Beethoven marks this movement andante con variazioni, but to me it is quite impossible to play all these variations like a metronome, all in the same tempo. I feel, but this is very subjective, so somebody else can feel differently. To me, the, the minor variation must be a, a shade slower than 
the rest, and the scherzo variation should be a, a shade livelier. And the last variation suddenly is the initial tempo. So this one... And this one... They are identical. So, then I finish this movement and we go into the next movement, which is a scherzo. Break, attacca. Uh, it's, it's a young Beethoven. It's full of full of energy. It's 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 exuberant. Uh, it's in piano, but very sudden accents. We don't know what key we are in, no? I mean, it it's, sounds like F minor. Yeah? And we don't know which way it's going. Now we know where we are, because it says it's repeated a, a fourth above. Uh, second part of the scherzo. In near F minor. But it's never in the root position, so we are sort of looking for the exit. Now he puts the theme in the bass. And above that, he, he, he gives us a wonderful counterpoint. And then turns it around. This is the trio. So, A flat major. Wonderful, the, the, the tonal relationships is the subdominant D flat major, and it is a, a swinging like a, like a waltz or like a lendler. The base of this. here an arch 16 bars long it's enormous I mean, which, which with that he wants to demonstrate that we must think very long in very long phrases this is what Wagner called in his music, the unendliche melody, the endless melody. But Beethoven knew it much before. <laughs> so, then, and back to the scherzo da capo. Now comes something extraordinary. We still haven't had a, a movement in sonata form, and we won't have it in this sonata. Now comes this famous movement that you all know. Uh, 
marcia funebre sulla morte d'un eroe, funeral march on the death of a hero. Now, this movement was always very popular already in Beethoven's lifetime, and he even made an arrangement of it for uh, winds and brass. And actually, it, it was even played at his funeral. And it's very important to remember that there is another funeral march. And this Beethoven sonata, Opus 26, was the only one that Chopin ever played in public. Uh, Chopin's relationship with Beethoven is rather ambivalent. He was a great uh, admirer of Bach and Mozart, but he had certain difficulties with, with Beethoven. But this sonata he always loved and played. And it is no coincidence that in both these works we find a funeral march. Now, why is it that this funeral march, both Chopin actually and Beethoven, is usually played so excruciatingly slowly? <laughs> because we, we, we associate you know, a funeral and death with slowness. But there is absolutely no indication in the score that this should be a slow piece. There is nothing, no lento, no grave, no largo. It's, it's a funeral march, and of course it's not a wedding march, <laughs> but, but there is something common between a, a wedding march and a funeral march, and that, that is the, the word march. <laughs> that, that that we are we are walking. It's 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 a so you, you are um, pom, pom, pom. There is a certain limit of how slowly you can walk. <laughs> it's subjective. It depends on your on your age, on your health. But it's still a march. It has to go. These chords, they are marked with a, with a dot, and they have to be played secco, dryly, without the pedal. Edwin Fischer, one of the greatest pianists ever and the great Beethoven player, he, he describes this very beautifully, that when, when there were funerals at Beethoven time, then they covered the drums with a thick black cotton cloth, and that, that gives us this very dry, damped sound. One would like to think of a program, but we do not know on whose death Beethoven was thinking here. Uh, there are different ideas and interpretations here. Uh, some are Napoleonic, that there are you know, certain war heroes from the, from the early Napoleonic wars. Uh, I rather tend to think that Beethoven was a great uh, admirer of, of Greek ancient literature and Greek tragedies and dramas. And, and if we think of, 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 of the Iliad, and if we think, for example, of, of the death of, of Achilles or the death of, of Hector, something like that, I think, is closer to the truth. Because Beethoven was more than an admirer of the military. To him, a, a hero had to be a very noble, very, very profound human being, and you don't necessarily look for that in the military. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so, but the whole 
movement is, is, very, is very picturesque. I mean, you don't need to have a program, but you see this procession that is coming from far away. It, it's coming nearer and nearer to us. It reaches us. Oh, she... It's fortissimo. First time we have real fortissimos here, and then the middle section, it is orchestrated. You you can hear drums, drum roll, and these are the trumpets and the horns. It's interesting that Beethoven puts the drum roll in pedal, but the trumpets and the horns have to be without pedal. He is very specific about that. Interpreters usually ignore it. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, pedal. You know. Very basic harmonies, just tonic, dominant, and subdominant. Second part of the trio. And back to the funeral march. So we have this, this very monotonous dotted rhythm, boom. But the actual melody is in the middle voices. It is a wonderful movement. So then it's identical to the to the first part, and then comes a very poetic coda. Yum. Over a pedal point. And now it's very dissonant. This is forzando, and it, it is like, like, like a knife in the heart. It's a Napolitan harmony. So the procession continues and disappears. don't have a sonata movement. This is a rondo. And out of this very somber, very dark picture emerges something that, again, I have to quote my beloved Edwin Fischer. He says that it's, it's like, like an autumn rain quietly falling on the grave. Uh, to me, it is also, also something something very poetic and not, not pianistic. Unfortunately, a lot of people make a, a piano etude of, out of this movement. Uh, Edwin Fischer warns us pianists not, not to make an etude, a Kramer or a Czerny etude out of this. If, if you read what Karl Czerny, Beethoven's most famous pupil, after all, and what he has to say about this sonata, true enough, he says this, this is a wonderful opportunity for a pianist to, to, to show off his dexterity. So you can play. And you hear it like that a lot. But I think it's terrible. <laughs> because it's, it's really, you know, 
when we see small notes and semiquavers, we shouldn't start to play fast immediately. It's, everything is relative. And there, these semiquavers, they conceal melodies and harmonies. <laughs> One is uh, such beautiful harmonies, and the whole structure is so asymmetrical, and it's like like a dialogue. Also, you know, after a funeral, people are quietly going home, and they they have a quiet conversation. One says, and another says. Now it, it came back. And it has a very, very stormy middle episode that is quite dramatic. just a, a, a short little storm in the middle and it has a of course a continuous semiquaver motion kind of perpetuum mobile but it's a very gentle finale and again look how how Beethoven finishes this wonderful sonata <laughs> in a pedal in the end and the whole thing evaporates and it's, it's anything but, but uh, spectacular he didn't write this sonata for, for effect or for success but it's, it's a great uh, poetic imagination and it's a new concept a sonata without a sonata form movement composed through there, there is no break between the movements. You, you could not play any of these movements separately. It wouldn't make sense. And it has to go through from the first note to the last note. 